Here we go. Matthew 23, 37. This is a text we're all familiar with, but I want to show you how to maximize your use of this verse. It's, it's unbelievably powerful. We're going to go through several different sections of Scripture to show the, the narrative here, the, the event that plays out, and we're going to show how Calvinism fails on multiple levels. This is huge. Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is right after they missed their his arrival uh, into Jerusalem when he rode in on the donkey, his presentation, his triumphant day, and they weren't there and they missed it. And now he's he's essentially prophesying that they're going to be left behind. Now, a Calvinist will point out immediately that Jesus wanted to gather the chicks. He wanted to gather the children, not Jerusalem. That's what they're going to say. And they're going to say that he does eventually gather the children anyway because he never fails. Right? Everything he decides to do comes to pass. And he's, uh, their, their, their claim is that he's frustrated with Jerusalem because Jerusalem did not want the children to come to Jesus. That doesn't work. I'm going to show you two things here, to what, uh, reasons why that doesn't work. Uh, actually, three, but a third one's a different, different uh, book. It's in Luke. Watch right here from Matthew. First, go to the King James Version, the original, either 1611, 1769, either one works. Watch how they render this. The, um, the Old English, or the Elizabethan English, works very well for this, and they captured, the, they captured the difference perfectly. When you see the words thou and thee, those are showing a, a subject, an object of a verb in singular format. When you see the words you and ye, that's the, either a subject or an object of a verb in plural format. Watch what they do here. We're going to look at the King James, and we're going to look at the Greek and show that it's confirming the King James rendering of these words. Jerusalem is mentioned as a singular group, like, like a team, right? A team has multiple players in it. A family's got multiple people in the family, but it's still one family, a singular unit. Jerusalem is mentioned, mentioned in singular form here. It says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou, singular, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, singular, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and plural, ye would not. You were unwilling. So both Jerusalem and her children were unwilling to come to Jesus. That's what it shows here. It switches from a singular group to a plural, a plurality of groups, and both of them were unwilling. Watch how the... Let me, let me pause this now. I've got to put up a screenshot. We're going to go through the Greek and show that's exactly what the Greek shows. It shows singular and plural as well. There you go. This one's from Bible Hub. You can also go to Bible Gateway or even Blue Letter Bible. All three of those websites were great for this. So Jerusalem is written twice, and it shows a noun, vocative, feminine, singular. Jerusalem is a singular entity. The first, uh, the first you that you would see in English is just inferred by the word hey here, and it's also feminine, singular. The second slide in the bottom left, Jerusalem is referred to as her. It's also feminine, third person, singular, still singular. And it finishes up, how often would I have gathered together the children of you, top left corners, genitive, second person, singular, Jerusalem, still singular, bottom left, it still says of uh, the chicks of her, Jerusalem is still third person, singular, bottom right, now it shows second person, plural, but you, plural, were not willing. Both parties, Jerusalem and the children, were not willing to come to Christ. And here's an added bonus as well, verse 38 says, the house is left to you, desolate. It's left to both parties again. The whole house is desolate for both Jerusalem and her children. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 19 now and confirm that the children were lost along with Jerusalem, like the, like the senior generation and the younger generation that were both lost. But I'm going to go further than that. We're going to show in a moment here that Jesus did not just want to save the children. He wanted to save all of them including the Jerusalem, Jerusalem group. If you go through Matthew 23, he's, he's rebuking the scribes and Pharisees through the whole chapter over and over again. You scribes and Pharisees, woe to you scribes and Pharisees over and over again. Then he gets here to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and it's no longer scribes and Pharisees, it's now Jerusalem in general. But we're going to go through other texts in a moment here and show why he wanted all of them to be saved, all of them to believe in him, all of them to come to him and follow him. And they didn't do it. None of them did. So let's go first and we'll verify the children here, that the, the Calvinist argument doesn't work for that. We saw it in the Greek and we saw it in the KJV. Here's Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44, confirming the children are lost. And in these four passages here, we're going to add another layer of, of evidence against Calvinism. Listen to every detail of, of judgment that comes upon Jerusalem. Watch this. We're going to cross-reference this with the beginning of Luke in one moment. Ready? Here we go. 
Luke 19, 41, start there. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this, it's your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. By the way, now means not before. It means now they're hidden from your eyes because they missed him. They missed the day. They missed the Messiah. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. So the children are lost. Let's keep going, though. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. They've got this thing. It's a visitation. That's the terminology here that the, the New Testament writers use. And in this visitation, they were supposed to receive peace. This was supposed to be at their day. They were supposed to be protected from their enemies. And none of these things came to pass. Follow me here to Luke chapter 1. We're going to see why this, this destroys Calvinism. Luke chapter 1. Go to from 67 to 79. All 13 verses. We're going to read all of them here. Okay. Start with 67. This proves it's not someone's opinion that's getting recorded by Scripture. This is the Holy Spirit talking. One of the arguments for Calvinism is that, um, when Jesus is weeping over the city, they'll say, well, well he's, he's reacting out of his humanity. That's why he's crying over the city. He didn't really want to save them because if he wanted to save them, they would have got saved. That's not the case because the Spirit is the one here in Luke chapter 1 who's prophesying these things to begin with. The Spirit has no humanity to talk out of. So the humanity argument for Jesus fails. That doesn't work. The Spirit here, I'm going to show you right now, the Spirit's talking through Zacharias. He just got his voice back because John the Baptist, well, he's going to be John the Baptist. John, his son, was just born. So he got his voice back and he starts prophesying from the Holy Spirit immediately. And everything the Holy Spirit promised for Israel didn't come to pass. That's a problem for Calvinism because they say this makes God a failure. In our view, God's not a failure. Follow me here. Watch. Luke chapter 1, 67 through 79. Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited, here's that visitation, the one said, you did not know the time of your visitation. This is what that was. He has visited and redeemed his people. So it's for their redemption. And he has raised up a horn of salvation for us. So their salvation is coming to them. In the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began. So the prophets have been speaking about this through all of history. That we should be we should be saved from our enemies, not not given over to our enemies and let them just destroy us like it's going to happen now in Luke 19 and beyond, but that we were going to be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember His holy covenant, the oath which He swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And then he looks at his son, his newborn son, prophesies over him, says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us. That's the, that's the whole the encompassing purpose of this visitation. The, the God came in the flesh. The Word became flesh. The uh, You can see that even where it says here that John the Baptist um, is going to be the one preparing the way for the Messiah. That's uh, You find that in Matthew 3, Mark 1, Luke 3, and John 1. Cross-reference that with Isaiah 40, verses 3, 4, and 5, and Malachi 3, verse 1. They didn't prophesy that the Messiah was coming. It is the Messiah, but they prophesied God would show up and God would come to His people. And the voice in the wilderness would prepare the way for God to show up. So when John the Baptist says... I'm the voice in the wilderness, and then he prepares the way for Jesus. Jesus is God. That's how powerful this is. It proves the Trinity and disproves Calvinism, my two favorite subjects. So that's, what, that's the whole thing. Okay? And that's the visitation that happens. God in the flesh shows up to Israel. Where are we at? That's verse 78. We got one more verse. To give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Let me go back now. We've got to read Luke 19 again. All those things that were promised to come to pass in Israel didn't come to pass. Why? Because God failed? No, because they failed Him. He showed up. It said to, this is to fulfill His promises to the, to the, 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 the patriarchs, all the, all the fathers beforehand. That He was coming through to make good on His promises to them, and He did. He provided everything that He promised He would provide. He was there. He showed up. He made it. And they didn't obtain it because they rejected Him. They're the failures here, not, not God. 
But unfortunately, Calvinism makes God a failure because this grace that was put right in front of them, by the way, it's, this can't the, the general call argument from Calvinists can't work here. That's why I wanted to cross-reference all these verses together because they'll say, well, there's a general call to repent. You know, they're, they're, the call goes out. Everyone needs to believe the gospel. And then the ones God has chosen, he gives them the ability to believe the gospel. That doesn't work here because it's not a general call. It's a specific set. This says in Luke 19, let's read it again. I'm going to emphasize the word your and you. I'm going to emphasize those, okay? Luke 19, 41 through 44. He drew near the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known even you, especially in this your day, not a general day, not some day, and if you're hearing me, then, you know, you can take advantage of it if, if, you, take advantage of it if you've got the ability. No, it says your day. It's your day is here. The things that make for your peace, it's your peace that's here. But now they're hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon, and then the enemies wipe them out, right? And it also says, because you did not know the time of your visitation. There's no general visitation. It's a specific visitation. Jesus says, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I wasn't sent anywhere else besides there. John says that Jesus came to his own. His own didn't receive him. His own is Israel. You know what's spectacular about this? These are the elect. Isaiah 45, verse 4 says, For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel my elect. By the way, that's a Hebraic, uh, Hebrew expression for uh, like a poetic parallelism there. So Jacob is synonymous with Israel, and um, election is synonymous with servanthood, not salvation. Isaiah 45, 4, let me show it to you here. It's uh, for Jacob my servant's sake, so Jacob is a servant, and Israel is the elect. And Israel, my elect. Israel is Jacob, and election is to service. We're going to do, do several episodes on that in the future. We're going to pluck election right out of Calvinism and put it right back where it belongs in Scripture. But uh, i got to save that for another time. It's going to take way too long if we go down that rabbit hole right now. But let me go back here. It says, remember it said, you did not know the time of your visitation. In, uh, where is it at? Luke 19, verse 40. 42 says, these things that were designed for your peace, this, this day, your day, and the things that were designed for your peace, he says, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Why now? Well, obviously they missed that the triumphant entry on the donkey, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just the final straw that broke the camel's back. They've been missing Jesus the whole time. Go to John chapter 12, read verses 37 through 41, and we're going to cross reference this again with Isaiah as well. Watch how strong this whole argument becomes for them, okay? Remember our episode two? We talked about how you can believe his words or you can believe what he, his works. Remember they said, you don't, you don't believe me, right? That's what the, um, John chapter 10 between verses 26 through 30, right? He says, you don't believe me because you're not my sheep. And what they didn't believe is what he told them. And then verses 36, 37, 38, he says, even though you don't believe what I'm saying, just believe what I'm doing. And then you can believe my identity. Well, he did those miracles. So we, we established in episode two on my channel here that, that his works were a second avenue for people to believe in him. That's why he did the miracles. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31 says, these miracles were designed, the signs were given so that you would believe in him. Watch this. John chapter 12, 37 through 41. This is why they got blinded also. Not just because they missed him, his arrival on the donkey. It's right here. It says, although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. So there, there's his, his offer, his presentation. Here it is. It's for you. Take it. Believe. I'm doing the signs so that you would believe. And they don't believe. And this is what Isaiah says in 1238. He says that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He's quoting from Isaiah 53. Uh, if you also want to see this, this is uh, 53, 1 and 2 is where it shows that um, the one, the, the arm of the Lord is like a reference to the Messiah coming. It says, for he, the arm of the Lord, will grow up before the Lord as like a tender plant from uh, Jesse, root out of dry ground, all that stuff, okay? Look at Isaiah 59, 16 and Isaiah 63, 5 as well. The same thing shows the arm of the Lord is the Messiah. That's Jesus. And they missed him. But the point here that John's making, he was revealed to Israel. That's the visitation. That's the same visitation that was for them and they missed it. And then it says, now this is why they became blinded. Verse uh, 12, John 12, 39. It says, therefore, 
because they, they, he did so many signs and they didn't believe in him. And Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled. Who believed our report? To whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? He says, therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah says again, he blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I would heal them. These things, this is what Isaiah spoke when he saw his glory, Jesus' glory, and spoke of him. So this disproves total depravity too. It says they were blinded so that they wouldn't see and hear and understand because they rejected the works. Total depravity is out the window as well. Election is out the window as well because these are the elect and they became lost. Limited atonement is out the window as well because it says salvation came to you and they didn't obtain it. And in limited atonement, everyone the atonement is intended for gets the atonement. And it shows salvation was intended for them and they didn't get it. So limited atonement fails. And irresistible grace fails. All of them fail. Irresistible grace fails because they didn't receive the grace that was placed in front of them. Specifically, it had, like, it had they, their name on it. This was for your day, your peace. This was the mercy of God for you. This was God's intention to fulfill His promises from, that He promised to the Father to bring you mercy. That's grace. And they didn't get it. They got none of it. So in Calvinism, if all these things are, are sovereign, immutable, they're always effectual, they're always, they're all, all those things, right? You know, all the, the acronyms, and not acronyms, all the descriptive terms, right? Where everything God wants to do happens. In Calvinism, every single thing here was God's failure. In our world of view, where we're not Calvinists, we're not, we're not bound to these things where God has to do certain things. None of these are failures of God. He perfectly fulfilled everything he intended to do. He provided salvation for them. He came through exactly when he was going to, exactly when he said, and they missed it. They're the ones who rejected him. And by the way, I mean, we're, there's so many things we can go through here based on this, this one Matthew 23, 37 narrative. This is the framework for Romans 9, that God is setting Israel aside and he has the freedom to work with anyone he wants to bring salvation to the rest of the world. That was the promise to Abraham, was that in your seed, all the nations will be blessed. And then specifically whittled down to Israel. All the nations will be blessed through Israel. And Israel failed God. So God puts them aside and works with the Gentiles instead to bring salvation to everybody else. And then in Romans 10, it says this is intended to move Israel to jealousy so that eventually, through the Gentiles, Israel comes back into the fold. So it's, it's a switch. That's what you see in Romans 9, Romans 10, Romans 11 also. It gets confirmed. We got, we'll do several episodes on Romans 9 in the future. Uh, but anyway, that's John 12, 37, 41. Isaiah 45, 4 says that um, Israel was the elect. And by the way, that's the only specific place where election is defined in the whole Bible, where it says, Israel, my elect. Everywhere else, election is mentioned and the elect are mentioned. It never clearly says who they are. There's, that's the one place that says who they are. And also... I mean, this, we can keep going forever. I have so much information here. John 12, 37 through 41. That's the only place in the whole Bible where it ever says somebody can't believe. Nowhere else will, does it say you can't believe. Even John chapter 10 says you don't believe. It never says they can't believe. This is the one reference that they can't believe. And the people who can't believe are the elect. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing how, how many times Calvinism fails. There's just... <laughs> Across the whole thing, if you know how the story plays out, they fail over and over and over again. And let me, let me show you another one here. Total depravity failed, right? Because it said they became blinded so that they wouldn't believe. That means they could have believed. They could have opened their eyes. They could have listened with their ears. They could have followed the miracles, followed the signs that Jesus put forth in front of them. That's why he does the miracles. We covered that in episode two again. We already mentioned that, okay? Go to Matthew 13. Here's another instance of the same narrative, and, and um, it, this is earlier, this is before he rides in on the donkey and everything, but Jesus and Matthew put this together for us, and they say this also fulfills what Isaiah was talking about as well. So we're free to use it. Even though it's, it's earlier in the timeline, we can use it because they said so. Jesus said so, and Matthew records it. Matthew 13, verses 13 through, excuse, 13 through 15. Says, I, you know, Jesus is talking to uh, Jesus is talking to the disciples and to the, the Pharisees who are around. He says, "I speak in parables, because seeing they they don't see, and hearing." Let, let me read. Let me read King James. I love how the King James renders this. Okay, let me let's switch here. Hang on. Therefore, speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith. 
By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. Watch this. For this people's heart is waxed gross, means like it's, it's grown cold, it's grown hardened. And their eyes are dull, or sorry, their, their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. So these, these people close their own eyes. And then it says this, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their hearts and should be converted and I should heal them. They're free to change their mind at any time they wanted to. And because their consistent rejection of the opportunity, that the genuine opportunity that was placed in front of them, they finally got blinded permanently and hardened permanently by God. He finally said, I'm done. We're not even done yet. We, we can, I mean, we're, we're, we're 20 minutes. We can keep going. There's so much meat in here. It's unbelievable. Go back to, uh, let me, go back to Luke. Let me, hang on. let me go back to Matthew first. When Matthew 23, uh, at the end of that part, 39, I believe, uh, 38, after he says, and you were unwilling, he says, your house is left to you desolate. You know how powerful that is? This was the house, this was the temple that they're talking about in, in the um, immediate context. First Chronicles 29 1 says the temple belonged to God. Not to them. But now God is giving up his own house and he's saying, here, take it. I don't even want it anymore. That's why, that's the significance of Jesus saying, your house is left to you desolate. Because it used to be God's house. Now, if you go to Luke, that hasn't quite happened yet. That happens uh, in, in a little bit. The, 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 really, it happens the day Jesus dies when the temple curtain rips open. I'll explain that in a second. Luke 19, he says at the end of it here, um, after verse 44, he's, uh, was it go 45 and 46? It says, Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. It's still, uh, Jesus still refers to it as my house, because that's how it was written previously, right? In, in scriptures. He says, It is written. He's referring to other scriptures here. But it's no longer my house, like the God's house. Now, in Matthew 23, 38, it's your house. He literally gave up his own house and gave it back to them, said, I don't want it anymore. And that's the significance of the temple curtain ripping. We were all told, I'm, I'm sure you guys were told too. I was told for years in, in church growing up and everything. Um, I didn't really grow up in church. I grew up in a Christian school. So I had you know, chapel in school. But anyway... I was told that the significance of the temple curtain ripping was God throwing open his hands saying, everyone's welcome in my presence. I thought about it. That doesn't work. We can approach his presence now because we're, co we're covered in Christ and he preserves us. But the rest of the unbelieving world still would have been consumed by his presence. That's what he told Moses. You can't see me and live. You'll, you'll get consumed. That's not to show that the temple curtain ripped open and he's throwing, he is throwing open his hands to everyone. He is doing that, but that's not the significance of the temple curtain ripping. It ripped from top to bottom, first to show God did it, not man. It wasn't like a, it wasn't like a plan that they, they schemed and you know, people ripped it to make a scene. God did it. That's why it ripped from top to bottom. And it ripped open to show the world God left that place. It tore open. Remember, remember the high priest had to sanctify and cleanse himself first before he could even go back into the Holy of Holies. He had to do that first before he could go back there. But now the temple curtain tears open and the Holy of Holies behind the curtain is exposed to the whole world, at least into that region where Jerusalem was, and nothing happened. I'm, we're, we're all fine. Everyone's fine. Nobody got consumed, believers and unbelievers, because God's presence left Israel the moment that Jesus died on the cross. And then it's confirmed in 70 AD when that house came tumbling down under Roman rule and it's never been rebuilt. That's the significance of God leaving Israel. That's the significance of Jesus saying, your house, it's yours now, I don't even want it. Your house is left to you desolate. Desolate meaning deserted, barren. Nothing's in it anymore. Nothing of value's in it. And by the way, that was the second temple, which uh, Haggai, I believe it's chapter 2, verse 9, says that the glory of that second temple was going to be greater than the glory of the first temple. Which was amazing, because the uh, the first temple was a lot bigger. There were a lot more sacrifices there. It had the Ark of the Covenant. It had it filled up with smoke when the presence of God was there. Fire came out of heaven and hit that temple. None of that happened with the second one. It was tiny. Um, I'll put them on the screen here. There, there's a reference where it says the people who remembered the first temple were crying in agony because the second one was so crappy. The ones who remembered the first one said this second, the second one sucks. <laughs> but God said the glory of the second one will be greater. Greater glory in the second temple, and he gave it up. That's how powerful this is that Israel walked away from him. Israel failed him, and now you're ready for Romans 9 as well.
Now you see how Romans 9 is so significant that God walks away from Israel and goes to work with the Gentiles and eventually through the Gentiles he'll bring Israel back. So anyway, I mean, we, we, we went to so many different areas here, but back to the beginning here. Can you see how Matthew 23, 37 is so powerful against Calvinism? That total depravity fails, limited atonement fails, irresistible grace absolutely fails. That one fails first, in, in, at least as far as I'm concerned. And then, I mean, all, all of it fails. And all of that makes God a failure if Calvinism was true. Because God sovereignly, and irresistibly, and immutably always does exactly what he says out to do. But it says here in Luke chapter 1, 67 through 79, God did in fact set out to save these people, to bring these people peace, to bring them their own mercy, to fulfill the promises made to their fathers with them, to rescue them from their enemies and bring them salvation in their visitation. It was their visitation and they missed it in Luke 19, 41 through 44. And all those promises that came through from Luke chapter 1, none of them came to pass. They all left because the people rejected their God. That's how powerful this is. And only if Calvinism isn't true does this make God successful because he successfully provided everything he wanted to for them. That was his intention. And he's never intended to force people or compel people irresistibly to accept his offers. So I hope that helps. That was an insane amount of information. I didn't plan on going through all that. I've just, I've got notes here that was actually for another episode. And I thought I'm just going through this right now. Forget it. But Anyway, that's powerful. A number of these things we're going to touch on again in the future. Um, John 12, 37 through 41. We're going to do a whole episode on that, showing why <laughs> it's amazing. that the, the only time that people can't believe they're elect. We're going to break that down in detail and show you that's accurate. And we're still going to do our next episode. We've got to do Judas. We're going to go back and cover episode three again, uh, John six forty four. that episode we did, and show that Judas was in fact intended, uh, salvation was in fact intended for Judas. And... Um, then we'll do Paul's conversion, show why that disproves total depravity. And uh, I mean, we'll see. We'll see where we go from there, guys. We've got a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of ground to cover. But um, anyway, this is a second um, evidence of a, a time when Jesus wanted to save someone and they didn't get saved. So this, this, I want to do this one first, right after episode three, because episode three, my whole case in John 6, 44 and the neighboring verses, 637, 665, 670, my whole argument was that Jesus did intend for those people from who followed him to Capernaum he did intend for them to trust in him and to believe in him. That's why he was telling them, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me and draws you here. If you haven't watched that one, if you haven't watched episode three, go back and watch that one. Because in that, in episode three, I made the case that Jesus, uh, he wasn't shooing them away, saying, oh, you guys are, you, you don't trust in me because you're not drawn by the Father. I was making the case that they were drawn by the Father and Jesus wanted them to continue and he's trying to build up their confidence to continue, even though they didn't and they walked away. So we did this episode as episode four, uh, specifically to show another instance in scripture where Jesus intended for someone to get saved. He desired someone to get saved and they failed him. So this episode, um, the story in this episode confirms the story in episode three. So I hope that makes sense. Um, let me know if you got questions. I, I assume lots of people do because there's a ton of information here. <laughs> See you soon.